spoilers for the anime movie Future War 1980X. Although Future War 1980X is a pretty unique anime, more than likely most anime fans have never heard of it. The movie itself isn't very good, which is unfortunate considering its 600 million yen budget, slightly less than twice compared to Farewell to Space Battleship Yamato, and about 3 times more than Nausicaa. Overly ambitious would be a way to describe this movie. Character designs in the movie were drawn by Orai Noriyoshi, who is most well known for illustrating the Empire Strikes Back's poster. It is an art style incredibly out of place for anime, too realistic and detailed to be captured properly in the medium. There were even costume designs by French designer André Courage, and the objective of being shown at the International Cannes Film Festival. These ambitions fall flat in making the movie entertaining. It's pretty hard to understand unless you already have knowledge of the existing geopolitical conditions in the 1980s. But what makes Future War 1980X worth watching is the realism in the speculative scenario. As the movie produced in the early 1980s, it's also an interesting watch given the geopolitical context of that time. That being the Cold War. The terror that people in the 80s felt, as the threat of nuclear war constantly tested new heights not seen since the Cuban Missile Crisis, is probably something people born later could never understand. Fear of mutual assured destruction was a looming concern during the Cold War, particularly among the youths, who would be constantly exposed to the broadcasts of nuclear threat. You just don't know if the war will end because of a small reason, like an error in the system, a miscommunication in the chain of command, radar disruption due to a solar flare, a bear randomly setting off alarms, or if someone gave a command while being drunk. All of which did actually almost cause at least one unintended nuclear detonation. Nuclear anxiety was very real. It wasn't uncommon to feel helplessness, stress, low life satisfaction, depression and low self esteem all of which was said to have affected youth mental health. It shouldn't be surprising that anti-war movements like the nuclear freeze campaign were popular. These sentiments were naturally shared by the Japanese, and it is behind this unfortunate context of living in constant fear that Future War 1980X was produced in. One of these fearful scenarios, as is the premise of the movie, is the development of an anti-missile defense system in space capable of destroying incoming nuclear warheads in mid-air. In real life, the commencement of an anti-missile defense system in space would be announced by President Ronald Reagan a year after this movie's release as the Strategic Defense Initiative. But their security did not rest upon the threat of instant US retaliation to deter a Soviet attack, that we could intercept and destroy strategic ballistic missiles before they reached our own soil or that of our allies. In a way, the movie is written in anticipation of that. But the reality is, such a program was not technologically feasible back in the 80s. This was mostly Reagan's personal vision rather than a project supported by current technological advancements. The program was met with much ridicule and criticism, being called Star Wars to imply it was impractical science fiction. If we were so foolish as to go ahead with it, after the expenditure of uh, a million million dollars, um, that uh, we would be far less safe than we are today. But what if such a defensive system was possible? As much as such a program is claimed to be for defensive purposes, in theory it could nullify the consequences of mutual assured destruction, allowing the United States to make an offensive first strike. In the first place, that was the reason why an anti-ballistic missile treaty was signed between the United States and Soviet Russia in 1972. When the Strategic Defense Initiative was announced by Reagan, the USSR certainly saw it as a threat and began increasing military spending further. Some had argued that the SDI contributed to the Soviets overspending on military, subsequently bankrupting the economy and forced to dissolve the Soviet Union in 1991. The alternative history as theorized by the movie was that the action of building such a system would alarm the Soviets to the pace of technological advancement in the arms race. This would then trigger a series of events leading to World War III. Soviet spies would kidnap the head scientist in charge of the space program to steal the tech. In response, the United States president orders for the escaping Soviet submarine to be sunk. However, ordinary torpedoes weren't sufficient, and a small nuclear torpedo was necessary to prevent the technological leak. With the states being the first to use a nuke, the Soviets discussed the possibility of war, especially when they are still ahead in the nuclear arms race. But not wanting a repeat of a Hitler scenario, the premier of the Soviets called for a standstill on the idea. 
This density would soon come to an end when they received news of a defection. A Soviet pilot brought their most advanced strike aircraft to West Germany. Now it is the Soviets' turn to react to a technological leak. Though the Premier seems to prefer a more covert operation aimed at destroying only the plane and pilot, he feigns due to an existing heart problem. Thus, allowing the warmongering members of the Politburo to take over command and initiate a more destructive raid. Supporters of the Premier were also arrested, allowing war to escalate. It should be noted that in real life, the leader of the Soviet Union at the time, Leonid Brezhnev, had suffered a stroke in 1975 and his health had been in rapid decline. Then in 1982, he died of a heart attack. The remaining members of the Politburo also weren't exactly in great health. His successor, Yuri Andropov, suffered from kidney failure and died after leading for 15 months. The next successor, Konstantin Chernenko, died in 1985 after a mere 13 months of leadership. A random heart failure seems like a convenient plot hole, but real-life evidence implies otherwise. In the escalation of the fictional war, NATO forces retaliate, and Soviets soon extended the war to Iran and nearby Middle Eastern countries in a bid to capture oil. With the Soviets rapidly expanding their war zone, Japan soon finds the country under attack as well. United States forces had also begun pushing back to Soviet territory, initiating attacks on Cuba. Caught in a destruction, officers on board a submarine equipped with nuclear torpedoes get into an argument. Two officers suggest a retaliatory nuke on Washington, to which the captain objects, and is only willing to do so under direct orders from the Politburo. Accusing the captain of being a traitor, the two officers killed the captain and launched four nukes directed at the United States. This scenario in the submarine is pretty similar to Black Saturday in October 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Although this is unlikely to be a reference, since it is only in 2002 that the existence of nuclear weapons on the submarine became public knowledge. On that day, the United States Navy discovered a flotilla of Soviet submarines. Hoping they would surface and identify themselves, the Navy dropped a series of signaling depth charges. These signaling depth charges were interpreted as an attack. The captain on the submarine wanted to launch a nuke, but submarine fleet commander Vasily Akipo argued and refused to launch. The flotilla of four submarines had been sent to Cuba by the USSR, given orders that they were allowed to use a special weapon if the submarine was damaged by depth charges or surface fire. At this time, the submarine was unable to contact Moscow and had already spent three weeks away from Mother Russia. The only information they were able to gather was by listening in to Miami radio where news stations were reporting of possible total mobilization from both the United States and Russia. According to this news, President Kennedy had pushed the DEFCON alert all the way to 2, just one step away from nuclear war. Meanwhile, conditions in the submarine were rapidly declining, with failing air conditioning, a thinning air supply and diminishing rations as they were weeks away from their homeland. The Soviet flotilla was not only under severe stress when they were discovered, they were in great anxiety as they had no idea if they were at war. Usually, the decision to launch the nuke only required two officers to authorize. It almost seems like pure coincidence that the fleet commander happened to be on board that particular submarine. Had Vasily been on another submarine, or if conditions were slightly different, there could have been a scenario where real life followed the script in the anime instead. Back to the anime, the short distance meant that there weren't enough time to stop the attacks. With no other course of action, the President of the United States orders a retaliatory strike fulfilling the Mutual Assured Destruction Doctrine. In the USSR, the Premier, who had waken up amidst the destruction, ordered a cancellation of any further exchange of nuclear attacks. Reasoning that the first nukes from the US would likely only be aimed at military facilities, the Premier was ready to surrender. But before negotiations with the United States President could be completed, the Politburo assassinated the Premier and carried on with the second barrage of nukes. The nuclear exchange would see Moscow, New York, Paris and Tokyo eliminated, engulfing nearly half the globe by the dull reddish hue generated by the explosion byproducts of nitrous acids and oxides. Deaths amount to an estimated 20 million, which I should point out seems to be a severe underestimation according to certain simulations. In space, Soviet interceptor satellites are deployed, targeting the anti-missile laser defense system to enable further nuclear strike. Having established space superiority, the Soviets have an overwhelming victory in the war. At this point, the rest of the movie didn't really seem very well thought out, and the conclusion just felt pretty abrupt. People around the globe, including ordinary Russians, tire of the war and call for peace. Ordinary Russians then free the remaining imprisoned Politburo, allowing them to kill the leaders of the war advocates, though not before more nukes were launched. 
By travelling to the remaining laser defense system and using manual methods, our main character was able to destroy the nukes to prevent further destruction. Yes, we do have a main character. At this point you probably realize that I haven't mentioned any characters, but that's mostly because they aren't really relevant or particularly interesting in this movie. In addition to having rather forgettable characters, the art style makes it hard to tell them apart from each other, which is made worse that one of those characters changed her hairstyle and hair color in just one scene in the middle of the movie for no reason at all. There was also some kind of quarrel with the Japanese main character's American girlfriend and another girl, but the romance ended up not having interesting elements. Perhaps the most unfortunate thing is that this movie could have been good. What we see now is a final product probably vastly different from the original script leaked to the Toei Labor Union in 1981. Supposedly that original script was considered too dangerous by the labor union, as the depiction of war was too realistic with no anti-war elements and was also too positive on nuclear escalation and Japanese intervention. It seems like that was the reason why the characters in this movie felt so pointless and why whatever this scene is supposed to be is in there. You see, the union had started a public campaign with many of its members refusing to contribute to the movie, and they even appealed to the National Teachers Union and Parent Teachers Association to protest against the production. This movement unexpectedly grew in popularity, gathering around 160 representatives from 10 different groups of parent teacher associations and teachers unions. On the 25th of May, they gathered in the Japan Education Center in Tokyo with the petition, Don't let them make war anime. The PTA argues that such movies shouldn't be shown to children, and it should be made less violent. Teacher unions criticized the negative representation of the USSR and overemphasizing Japan's role in the war in relationship with the West. Labor unions didn't want to work on a movie that they ideologically rejected. After the future war debacle, in April 1983, a flyer circulated throughout all anime studios in Tokyo with the title Stop the Nakasone Government, Let's Build a Peaceful Tokyo. This was distributed by a coalition between multiple animation divisions and film industry unions. Among the 167 signatures included names like Takahata Isao, Miyazaki Hayao, Kondo Yoshifumi, Kanada Yoshinori, Otsuka Yasuo, and Shinbo Akiyuki, all well-known anime veterans in our current time. It is here that we can learn the general political views of many anime creators at the time, who were mostly against the policies of Nakasone Yasuhiro, who, since becoming Minister of Defense in 1972, raised the budget of the Japanese self-defense forces to three times, and also supported the idea of Japan holding their own nuclear weapons. After becoming Prime Minister in 1982, Nagasone was also highly active in foreign affairs, improving relationships with the USSR and China. Most notably, he was very friendly with US President Ronald Reagan, and was known for his proclamation that Japan would serve as an unsinkable aircraft carrier for the US. Anime creators opposed policies including the support for US military operations in Japan, the lack of subsidies for education and culture, and the shrinking social measures for the elderly. I am speculating here. But we can see the result of that resistance against increasing Japanese militarization in the final movie. Aside from the Japanese main character who didn't matter, Japanese related scenes are pretty much just some cabinet members talking about how they need to defend themselves and a few scenes of Japan being bombed. In effect, little Japanese involvement may have made a more realistic scenario, but it made the story pretty inconsequential. And within the anime industry, many discussions were sparked and mostly published in the Animage magazine. Toei CEO Watanabe Yoshinori and co-director Katsumata Tomoharu had argued that 1980X wasn't different from live-action films and they were opposed to the industry standard of accepting toys and figurine sponsorship to create anime. 1980X's goal was always to show that war isn't fun or entertaining, and it seemed like the target audience was never children, even though children are the ones most likely to watch anime at this time period. There was also a column by Yasuhiko Yoshikazu who criticized 1980X as unworthy of its high budget. He also said, I quote, As a film, anime is unsuitable for a serious consideration of war. End quote. Seeing this written by the character designer and animation director of Mobile Suit Gundam, a show known for being about war and politics, can only be said to be highly perplexing. 
Such debates among creators and readers of the magazine would continue from the April 1982 issue all the way to December 1982. The important point is that multiple creators felt that anime's monetization system of selling toys to children was inherently flawed, and anime will never be able to tackle complex topics if the system did not change. Modern anime viewers might be quite confused by the controversy resulting in the changes, but anime as it was back then was still in the art form's infancy stage and were mostly made for children. Adult-oriented themes like violence or politics only became more acceptable for the medium a few years later when demand for OVAs, or original video animation, grew as VCRs became a common fixture in homes. Talking about war in a speculative manner that could actually happen in real life wasn't generally accepted, since it was interpreted as encouraging children to engage in war. Nowadays, with the wider range of media and audiences, a realistic anime with believable geopolitics based on real life would hardly be anything special or controversial. But the controversies and speculative nature of Future War 1980X remains something unique to it in anime, and a testament to the genuine fear for World War III in the 80s.